Or honorable members. Or honorable members. Please take up your seats. Thank you. Honorable members, before we proceed with today's business, I wish to announce that the vacancy which occurred in the National Assembly, owing to the resignation of Ms. L. N. Moss, has been filled with effect from 5 March 2023 by the nomination of Mr. E. Patel. Honorable members, you will recall Mr. Patel was appointed by the President as a minister from outside of the Assembly in terms of Section 91, Subsection 3, Paragraph C of the Constitution. Lastly, the vacancy which occurred owing to the resignation of Mr. D. D. Mabuza has been filled by the nomination of Mr. H. M. Z. Memezi, with effect from the 1st of March 2023. The members have made the subscribed oath before the speaker, and I would like to welcome the honorable members and the honorable Mamezi back into the National Assembly. Welcome back. Thank you. The secretary will read the first order. Order, honorable members. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Transport. Order, on oh, uh, secretary, can you just stop, please? Seems to me the members don't want to hear the order. They want an open debate. Can you read the order, please? Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Transport on Marine Pollution Prevention of Pollution from Ships Amendment Bill. I will now recognize a member of the committee, the Honorable Kumalu, who will address the House on the bill. Thank, thank you, Honorable Chair, the House Chairperson, uh, Honorable uh, Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable uh, Members, uh, Honorable Members of uh, Portfolio Committee, uh, greetings to the, our new from the box, uh, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister of Transport. The Portfolio Committee on Transport is tabling to the House for, the, for consideration and approval the report of the Portfolio Committee on Transport and seeks the passing of Marine, of marine Pollution Amendment Bill. The bill is important on, for multiple reasons on pollution, of Pollution Amendment Bill. The bill is uh, important for multiple reasons uh, that South Africans' legislation in terms of in terms of pollution is in line with current international convention and law. Ocean's economy is important to the economic development of the country and therefore needs to be protected from different types of pollution based on best international practice and standards. Honorable Chair, protection of the ocean's ecosystem and environment must, environment must form part of the country's progressive policies to preserve marine life and minimize pollution. Legislation of the country has traditionally kept abreast with the application of international law, and the country has, can pride itself on inter international best practice in, in maritime sector. However, carbon emissions from fossil fuels and climate changes are a serious global concern for our country and the global community, and South Africa must play a positive and progressive role in this regard. In different parts of the country, we have left felt the effective and destruction of uh, incremental weather on our communities. Therefore, we must be part of the global leadership on reversing environmental degrad degradation and pollution. The Marine Pollution Amendment Bill is part of ensuring that domestic legislation is 
uh, in keeping with best intentional practice and have little tolerance for pollution of our territorial wa waters. The bill seeks to amend the Pollution Act of 1980, 1986. Specifically, the bill seeks to incorporate into South African law annexure, annexure four of the, of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ship and to incorporate the 1997 protocol in order to, to give the effect annexure of six of the six convention. This ensures that legislation in terms of marine pollution from ships is based on world-class standards. The Marine Pollution Amendment Bill seeks to incorporate the Marine Pollution International Convention fourth and protocol, which is linked to Annexure six of the convention into South African law. The bill determines that the Marine Authority in the form of port regulator through the minister can determine the technical standards for shipping above 400 met metric tons to enforce the regulation relating to mar maritime pollution by law. Honorable House Chair, and the amendment relates to the, preven to the prevention of air pollution from ships to, through their exhaust chimney as, they, as, as this contributes to carbon and sulfur emission. This has resulted in the bill declaring re regulations of the designated emission controls, emission controls. In this regard, the bill regulates the, per the permitted types of emission abatement of ships. This is important as the fuel specification for marine bunkers can change to lower, to lower the sulfur levels. And therefore all vessels need to utilize marine bunkers in line with current global specification. It also enables the ports regulated to the usage of, of accredited laboratories eligible to test the fuel sample and the associated cost. Furthermore, the bill provides for the prevention of pollution by sewage from ships and for the removal of endocrine disruption substances from sewage stream before it is treated. Honorable Chairperson, the bill allows uh, for the enforcement protective measures in particular sensitive sea areas and other specific areas. And it is in, in this case, the country has harbor such as Saldana Bay in, in, ecological sensitive, in ecological sensitive areas that requires protection from marine pollution. Honorable Member, your time is now expired. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. I will now recognize political parties wishing to make a declaration, the opportunity to do so, and the usual times for declaration will apply. The DA. And get to us, Carlo, and upon one of two men, a speech, some of them changing, Tanuk Tatali, two and he told the same when you are moving with uh, with a successful uh, commemoration of Umnyanya uh, over the weekend. And we had uh, attendance from across political parties in the South, which was held in Pretoria. So we'd like to say uh, thank you very much to Stava Sokes, Leosit Bayetingunya. Research scientist Willis and others made the following observation that increasingly the ocean has typically been viewed as a sink for pollution. This is problematic and points to an urgent need for lawmakers to act with speed decisively and develop policy that will protect our ecological systems. As such, South Africa is no exception. Furthermore, I also agree with Willis and others that there is sufficient data on the human health, social, economic, and environmental risks of marine pollution, resulting in increased awareness and motivation to address the global challenge, however, a significant lack exists within implementation strategies to address this issue. In part, South Africa was also lagging behind in, synch in synchronizing our domestic policy and aligning it with international best practices and benchmarks, but also to ensure that we are consistent with the global practices that regulate the marine space. As stated above, that the bill in the main is to enable domestic policy to give effect to the International Maritime Organization that regulates discharges from spills and waste generated on board 
through maritime pollution rules 73 and 78, as well as to ensure the fulfillment of this international maritime regulation, the maritime pollution rule 73 and 78 convention, international convention for the protection of pollution from ships of 1973 as amended by the 1978 protocol and 1997. Furthermore, this involves reviewing the mandatory fees for lending sewage waste in the port, the sewage treatment costs and the environmental impact of the treated affluent from, from the vessels, environmental benefits and addressing technical difficulties in order to meet the normative standard required from vessel sewage in the regulatory framework of our local ports. In, in the main, the bill seeks to incorporate and integrate the Marine Pollution Annex 4 and, and Annex 6 into the domestic policy toolkit and give it effect. This in part to giving effect to the convention to address and regulate sewage treatment plans as regulated by Annex 4 of the Marine Pollution. Honorable Chairperson, in closing, the day further supports the consequential amendments emanating from the bill such as the increase in the fines and penalties regime in the event that non-compliance occurs from 500,000 to 10 million rands or to imprisonment, to imprisonment for a period not exceeding 10 years as this would serve as a deterrence to possible non-compliance. Ironically, the integration and incorporation of these two maritime pollution international conventions for the prevention of pollution from ship is long overdue in our domestic framework, considering the fact that it is almost literally a copy and paste of the International Maritime Organization <coughs> policy. Now, the IMO adopted these two protocols first in 1970 and in 1997. It took the ANC government 26 years to just copy and paste these protocols into our legislation. Talk about ANC incompetence. Now, with that said, our esteemed organization, the incoming government of 2024, through our president, Honorable John Steinese, has always held the view that policy is not a challenge, but the political will and the spectacular failure to implement policy by this incompetent ANC government is our Achilles heel. And as such, we can assure South Africans that when Honorable Jen Stenis and comes in as a president, we're going to ensure that one, we're going to give you good policies, but it's going to be very decisive. But also the fact that Honorable Jen Stenis and has a Capitec bank account, something that the president has no idea of because he stores his money in, in couches. Furthermore, uh, <clears throat> would like to say the DA support the bill. Thank you very much. Bye, Tengenga. Thank you, Honorable Member. The EFF. Thank you, Chair. Ch Chairperson, the EFF is in support of the bill. The bill specifically introduces amendments that ensure compliance with our international law obligations. In as far as the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships is concerned, the specific requirements from the convention requires that the state put measures in place regarding the discharge of sewage in the sea from ships, including regulations regarding the ship's equipment and systems for the control of sewage discharge the provision of port reception facilities for sewage and requirements for survey and certification. While it is generally accepted that on the high seas, the oceans are capable of assimilating and dealing with raw sewage through natural bacteria action, these regulations seek to prohibit the discharge of sewage into the sea within a specified distance from the nearest land unless otherwise provided. We welcome the position of the bill in ensuring the incorporation of these regulations in the bill. Toxic spills are, threat, are a threat to our environment and the marine life. The adherence to the MAPOL Convention will assist in the reduction and use of toxic material. That's promoting and improving a safe and healthy work environment. This will also help in protecting mar mar marine wildlife and its habitats. 
We also welcome the mechanism that has been put in place to monitor and investigate incidents in South African waters. Although we would have loved to see the inclusion of heavy sanctions, such as the confiscation of ships for repeat offenders, the increase in fines and imprisonment threshold give us the comfort that the government is committed in ensuring that polluters are severely punished for their crimes. The introduction of severe penalties will also serve as a deterrent. While we support the bill, we are worried about the narrow angle approach that seems to focus on pollution by ships only. We should envisage pollution from such sources as artificial space, bodies, debris, and chemical warheads falling into our shores one day. Deliberate dumping of waste by multinational corporations by either air or marine conveyance should be forced, to, should be factored in and to carry hefty, hefty fines, including consecration of such means of conveyance from repeated offenders. Finally, allowing the minister to extend terms of mem members would create a fertile breeding ground for corruption cater deployment and unfair manipulation. We also want to say that the bill's intention to declare certain areas for emission control within the vicinity of major South African ports is a step to the right direction. However, we want to caution the minister and the Department of Transport to ensure that the appointment of committee members is done in a fair and transparent manner. It should be individuals with ne the necessary skills and expertise on the matter in question and not cater deployment. The EFF supports the bill. Thank you, Honorable Member. The IFP. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. South Africa is a military country which accounts for 3.5% of world sea trade. And, and, and where 80% of trade value is driven by the sea. Therefore, the protection of our coastal lands and their resources is not is rooted in our connective need to grow and develop our country. However, our, coast, our coastlines are incredibly important for local coastal communities, as many of those living in this country. Honorable member, can, can you just take your seat, please? Honorable Nzuza on the platform, you are now for the third time having your microphone on. May I just ask the NA table just to connect, disconnect the microphone and ask one of the ANC whoops to communicate with that deputy minister, please. Please proceed, honorable member. Thank you, Chair. The IFP welcome this bill focus on prevention of pollution from ships. As we have witnesses firsthand how the closure of several South African public Beaches due to severe and, and, and garbage pollution during the December 2022 holidays impacted local communities relying on income from tourists. At present, some of these communities are still struggling for polluted beaches. In September 2022, the Department of Transport announced that it was considering it to the, the fine increase from 500,000 rent to 10 million rent from military pollution to make non-compliance by ship expensive. The department reason for increase was to strengthen the arm of, this, of the state to ensure a recovery of damage resulting from pollution from fuel bankers and other chemicals. Why we appreciate this means of addressing non-compliance, we have to contend that there is an urgent need for the government to become more proactive instead of reactive on matters related to coastal lines. An extra six of MAPOL, as referred to by the report, essentially prohibited, prohibits the discharge of, of sewage into the sea unless ships have the necessary systems to sewage disposary in place where ships are operational. Therefore, it is our suggestion that the department focus on practically implementing this, for example, by having the so a system of, of ships approved before they operate on our seas. It is department duty to ensure that this does not become yet another piece of, of well amended legislations pending implementation indefinitely. 
the IFA do support the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The FF Plus. Thank you, Voorzitter. The bill seeks to amend the marine pollution prevention of pollution from ships at 198C. The amendments incorporate international marine pollution conventions that ensure that South African maritime law is in accordance with the best international practice. The wijziging verwijst naar verschillende overtredings wat gepleeg kan worden door onder andere oliestorting. Ons is allemaal bewust van die schade wat die storting in die see kan veroorzaken en die kosten om dit te verwijderen. Dit het ook een baie negatieve impact op die see lewe. Ons lees dikwijls hoe seevoels wat met olie bedek is dier vrijwilligers oor een lang tijdperk schoongemaakt wordt en dan weer teruggeplaatst wordt in die see. Die mense is van die grootste oorzaken vir die besoedeling van ons oceane. Dit is dus belangrijk dat die wereld kennis geneem het van die besoedeling en alles hulle vermoed doen om dit te verminder of te verhoed. Amendments of a section dealing with offenses was amended as the fines and sentences in the original act was not in line with current international norms and standards as international law is not sympathetic to marine pollution or any other pollution. The committee report for adop adoption and passing of a bill by the National Assembly was supported by all the political parties. The freight front on the steering. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The ACDP. Uh, thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. The ACDP notes that this bill seeks to amend the Marine Pollution Prevention of Pollution from Ships Act so as to give effect to a next year four of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships and to incorporate the 1997 protocol in order to give effect to a next year six of the convention and to provide for matters connected therewith. Furthermore, the ACDP recognizes that this bill will provide the Minister of Transport with powers to make regulations relating to, amongst others, the prevention of air pollution from ships, the prevention of pollution by sewage from ships, and any other incidental administrative or procedural matters that are necessary for the proper implementation of the Principal Act. Those found guilty of these and other listed offences shall be liable to a fine not exceeding 10 million rand or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding 10 years. Now, in the year 2021, the Mail and Guardian reported that the minimum lifetime cost to South Africa of pollution produced in 2019 alone by big ships and ordinary citizens set at a staggering 885 billion rand, including damage to livelihoods and key economic industries, such as fishing and tourism, cleanup cost to the government, and threats to the health of the population. The African Christian Democratic Party welcomes this important piece of legislation as it will enable us to play a leading role in adopting and encouraging more sustainable attitudes and practices to promote healthy ocean and marine systems. The ACDP believes that the bill responds well to increase our efforts in forcing shipping companies to take more responsibility for their ocean pollution output, whilst at the same time raising awareness around protecting, preserving our oceans, its ecosystems and marine life. Chairperson, this bill has the potential to position South Africa as a serious player when it comes to the sustainable and responsible use of the ocean for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs and ocean eco ecosystem health. This resolve, however, the ACDP believes, will be tested when Minister Creasy decides on the car power ship appeal. The ACDP supports the bill. I thank you. Thank you. The UDM. No declarations, Chair. UDM supports. Thank you. The ATM. Good. The NFP. Thank you, House Chairperson. Allow me to start off by welcoming our Deputy Speaker. It's indeed a great pleasure and honor to see him back in the House. Uh, the National Freedom Party notes the report here today and supports the bill. The bill seeks to amend the Marine Pollution Prevention of Pollution from Ships, particularly Act of 1986, 
to give effect to Annex Chair 4 of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, to incorporate the 1997 protocol to give effect to Annex Chair 6 of the Convention and to provide for matters con connected herewith. Annex Chair 4 contains a set of regulations regarding the discharge of sewage into the sea from ships. Let us not forget, Chairperson, that marine industry contributes immensely to the economy of this country, but very importantly, particularly to those local economies, like if you take the port of Durban and the Teguini municipality as a whole. Now, whilst we need to protect marine life, we also need to protect human lives. And I think this bill, Honorable House Chairperson, goes a long way in doing just that. And I think we must welcome this bill, those that have introduced it, the hard work that was put into it to bring it to today where we are actually adopting it. So let me com commend and congratulate all of you that have actually played a pivotal role in making this uh, come to a success. Let us note that in proposing a fine, which will increase from 500,000 rand to 10 million rand will certainly be a deterrent for these shipping companies and so that they could respect marine life and more importantly, human life. Um, the alternative to the fine will be an imprisonment that will not exceed 10 years. So we are hoping that with the fiscal situation in the country that if they do breach it, they would rather pay the 10 million rand we need the money because correctional facilities are actually uh, to a very large extent full currently. It is one of the, Itaguini is one of the few ports in the country which is very close to the central business uh, district. And as such, the, the spin-offs are quite high and great. However, pollution does affect the community of Itaguini. The National Freedom Party believes that in the interest of marine life, in the interest of economies and the public as a whole, and particularly with the deputy minister of health sitting here and the impact it will have on the lives of our people, the National Freedom Party supports this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, honorable member. The AIC. Go. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Please proceed. An, an extra four of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from ship, ships contains strict provision relating to the control of pollution of the sea by, uh, by sewage, including the discharge of sewage into the sea. It is these provisions aimed at introducing and codifying the control of pollution by sewage from ships, which the Marine Pollution Amendment Bill is introducing. It is convenient to remind this house that South Africa is a signatory to a number of international instruments dealing with climate change, such as the United Nations Framework Convention of the Climate Change. In this year's COP27 uh, conference held in Egypt, there was no denying that climate change was the greatest threat to mankind. The bill incorporates the convention's quest to regulate marine pollution, thereby minimizing the threat to marine ecological integrity. The effect of the bill will see the regulations of the new ships of over 400 tons. Also, the bill con contains strict, strict requirements uh, with regard to surveys and certification of ships. It is also it also requires sewage treatment plants to prevent the discharge of raw sewage from ships into the ocean. This is an important intervention. It will prevent marine con concealed medical waste uh, from being dumped into our oceans without consequences. The greatest obligation, we argue, lies with the South African Mar Maritime Safety Authority. It must provide land-based reception facilities for sewage in, in the ports. The authority will have to exercise control over ships and their sewage systems in our waters. We further note the incorporation of an extra five of the Maritime Protocol in the bill, which, which in essence will culminate in the reduction of a global suffer in, in, in fuel from 3.5% five uh, percent to 0 0.5 percent we support all these developments including this bill i thank you 
Thank you, Honourable Member. The PAC? Chair, the PAC supports the bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Al Jama? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable House Chair. Honourable House Chair, like the PAC, Al Jama uh, supports the amendments. It's a legacy that the outgoing Minister of Transport has left. And we hope that the regulations that will follow uh, will assist the country with regard to the pollution of our oceans. Honourable House Chair, I, I am very happy for these amendments because, you know, uh, one of Cape Town's favourite fish is snook. And the University of the Western Cape got a one million rand research funding to find out what this pollution does to our snook. So you had students at the University of Western Cape for months and months cutting up the snook and examining it. And they found the, the sewerage pollution in the snook. So we are very concerned that our snook is being harmed and our favorite dish snook in Cape Town is gonna harm. So I hope that these regulations will enable three ministers, empower three ministers, the Minister of Health, Environmental Affairs, and I don't know how transport slipped in, but they also slipped in to protect our snook. So for the sake of protecting our snook, I know we don't get any votes from snook. al supports these amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Member. The ANC? Ndo libu wa muulisei, murangazuro. Bahuri sei vote vane baba hone na rushaka rote di masiari. Honorable Chairperson, the African National Congress support the Marine Pollution Amendment Bill of B5 2022. The bill seeks to amend the Marine Pollution, Pollution Act number 1986. The bill seeks to incorporate into South African law annex chapter four of the Wait, International Baba. Convention. Say, and the one number the lady advantage I pay so for honorable honorable member. May Order, honorable members, may I once again request those members on the virtual platform to pay attention firstly to the debate because if you just switch on your microphone, you're obviously not paying attention. Mute your microphones. And I must also instruct the table staff with the ICT unit as soon as a microphone goes on and the member inadvertently switches it on, just switch it off, please. Please continue, honorable member, and my apology for the interruption. Thank you, honorable chairperson. The bill seeks to incorporate into South African law Annex Four of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships and to incorporate the 1997 protocol in order to give effect to Annex Six of the Convention. The bill B5 2022 was referred to the Portfolio Committee on the 31st of January, 2022. On the 6th September, 2022, the department briefed the portfolio committee. The bill was published on the 15th September, 2022 to 31st October, 2022. The bill was published to commence in national, was published for comment in national, regional newspaper and on the parliament website. Submission were received from stakeholders on the 15 November, 2022. The department responded to the written submission. The committee concluded deliberation on the bill on the 7th February, 2023. And there were no amendments to the bill as it is. The amendment bill seek to incorporate the Marine Pollution International Convention 
and protocol, which is linked to Annex 6 of the Convention into South African law. The bill determines that the Marine Authority through the minister can determine the technical standard for shipping above 400 metric tons in force regulation by law. The amendments relate to the prevention of air pollution from ships, the prevention of pollution by sewage from ships, the removal of endocrine dis disrupting substances from sewage streams before it is treated and released. The permitted types of emission abatement equipment, the requirements for the disposal of waste generated by the mitigation equipment. Honorable Chairperson, usage of accredited laboratories eligible to test the fuel samples and the associate cost. Regulation of designated emission control areas. The enforcement of protective measures, in particularly sensitive sea areas and other special areas. And on generally any other or incidental administrative or procedural matters that are necessary for the proper implementation or administration of the act. Amendment of the section dealing with offenses was amended. The fines and sentence in this original act was not in line with current international norms and standard. International law is not sympathetic to marine pollution or any other pollution. Any person convicted of an offense under subsection one shall be liable to a fine not exceeding 500,000 or 10 million or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding five years or 10 years or to such fine as well as imprisonment. The powers of the minister or official designated have increased to the effect, the amendment and protocol as well as regulation. The minister is also allowed through amendment to have an adversary panel of experts which can assist in assuring, uh, which can assist uh, the, the, the minister. The regulation dealing with the discharge of sewage and other in influence, influence into the sea is part of the announcement of the bill and become law with the passing of the bill. On the 6th of September, the Department Transport, when briefing the committee, the committee, the portfolio committee of the, uh, for the, the, the portfolio committee adopted and passing of the bill by the, uh, and, and then was, there was no uh, opposition in that meeting. So in, that, in other words, there is no opposition to the bill. The House to, to, must consider and adopt the, the report. In that note, as the portfolio committee, as you heard, there was no, uh, 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 there was no any party that was disagreeing. We all agree with the, uh, this bill. In that note, the ANC supports the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Thank you. I now recognize the Honorable Deputy Chief of the Majority Party. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. I move that the bill be adopted. The Thank motion you. is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The Secretary will read the second order. Second reading, Marine Pollution Prevention of Pollution from Ships and Amendment Bill. Ships and Amendment Bill. Honorable Member says there is no list of speakers. Are there any objections to the bill being read a second time? 
No objections agreed to. The secretary will read the bill a second time. Marine pollution prevention of pollution from ships amendment bill. The bill will be sent to the National Council of Provinces for concurrence. The secretary will read the third order. Consideration of report of portfolio committee on transport on transport appeal tribunal amendment bill. I now recognize the Honorable Kumalu, a member of the committee that will address the House on the bill. Honorable Chairperson, the committee, the portfolio committee on transport adopted the report on the transport appeal tribunal with amendments and that was supported by all parties. The bill sought to amend the definition in the act and to link all relevant transport legislation in terms of the late in terms of the National Land Transport and Cross-Border Transport Act to this act and to enable transport re regulatory authority to make decisions in terms of licensing with binding and in relation to number regulation. And bring the act in line with development since the implementation of the act as a number of different pieces of legislation has been passed and needed to be connected to the legislation to empower the decision making process of the authority. The bill provides for certain powers of the Transport Appeal Tribunal in terms of the composition of board members, not more than nine members and not less, and and not less than five members. And it selects and needs to okay and after consultation with every member of the executive to council, of, of executive council in every province is responsible for transport matters. It also seeks the appointment of fit and proper persons as matter of tri tribunal on the grounds of their knowledge of experience in financial, economic, commercial, legal, public, and, and public transport, or any other matters relating to the functions of the tribunal, tribunal. It allows the minister to extend the terms of office of members of the transport appeal tribunal. Chairperson, it also allows the minister to extend the term of office of the members of the tribunal it empowers the trans it empowers the transport appeal tribunal as the tribunal to be able to make decisions related to all relevant transport legislation such as the national land transport act and the cross border transport act and to make decision in terms of licensing through linking this legislation to the national land Tran land transport act and the cross border act the Department of Transport briefed the committee on the proposed amendments by uh, on the 25th of August 2021. The committee resolved to, the pub to publish the bill for, co for comment from 1st September 2021 to 8 October 2021 and to conduct public hearings to hear public opinions and comments on the propo proposed amendment. The bill was published for comments in national and regional newspapers on the pa parliament website, which is Twitter and Facebook. The period for comment was extended to 18 February 2022 for further comments. Many regulatory and, trans and transport bodies were consulted on the bill and submissions were received from How Train Management Agency and Western Cape Department of Transport and Public Work, and public work, public work as well. Both stakeholders opted not to oral, not to submit oral oral submission in addition to the written comments. Departments responded to the written submission on the 1st of November. The committee could conclude its deliberation on the bill on 7 February 2023 with, adop with the adoption of the proposed list of amendment bill. The ANC supports uh, the amendment bill, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I will now recognize political parties wishing to make a declaration, the opportunity to do so, and the usual times for declaration of votes will apply. The DA. Now, Chair, given the range of aspects that were necessary to review, from licensing application processes to the manner of use thereof when awarded, 
Different to the NLTA and ARTO Acts, this time proper work was done by the Portfolio Committee. Overarchingly, the Transport Appeal Tribunal Amendment Act can be viewed as a third component of what if united towards better road use and changed road user behavior. Instead, what we are considering here today now seem to be an isolated administrative addition and a remedial utility. Sadly, the Transport Appeal Tribunal Amendment Act of today will have to idle in the driveway until the ARTO and NLTA Acts are fixed. Both of these related bills were dealt with in a rushed manner, tick boxed and rubber stamped on all sides by the ANC, while all along the DA warned about gaps and lacks which might not survive constitutional scrutiny and as a result delay implementation. Not too long ago, this portfolio committee had to deal with the embarrassment of a returned NLTA. Seven days ago, the Road Traffic Infringement Agency sobbed before us in the Portfolio Committee because ARTO is still with the Constitutional Court instead of generating income for them. Nothing short of counting the ostriches before they hatch, the executive team went from an average earnings of 1.3 million rand each per year to 7.5 million rand, 12 plus paychecks, performance, and Christmas before bonuses. Had our ANC colleagues in the portfolio committee applied their minds with NLTA and ARTO as they did with this bill, it could have been a lot different. Much of the frustration that public transport service providers, users, and administrations have to deal with currently is as a result of poor and undercomplete content of both the NLTA and ARTO. Related to these, this bill will establish the function of an appeal to deal with appeals of applications of public road carrier permits, operating licenses, and cross-border or carbonage permits. The TUT's judicial mandate is to hear noted appeals emanating from the decisions made by the National Public Transport Regulator, Provincial Regulatory Entities, Municipal Regulatory Entities, and Cross-Border Road Transport Agency Regulatory Committees. The beginsel van onpartijdigheid is voldoende geïncorporeer met die vestiging van statutaire provinciale en municipale vervoer registrateers. Die DAA is vol vertrouwen dat die restructuur moet verbeter in termen van die gedrag van verenigings, operateurs en bestuurders die in oortlente. Met slechts een paar provincies en zelfs minder municipaliteiten wat tot dusver plaatselijke geregulerende lichame gevestig het, moedig die DAA dit wel aan. Dit zal die nodige structuur daarstel in ooreenstemming met die grondwetelijke gemandateerde vervoerafvaardigingsrolle en functies in die besonder om die beginsel van scheiding van machten te ondersteun. Control to extend the term of the office of the tribunal members by the minister has been limited to 12 months and, the, and to enhance the fit and proper list of requirements for appointments, the retained competencies in the field of economics, commercial and legal sectors, career experience in the public transport sector were added. In conclusion, the DA supports this bill as the last phase to the layered structure of municipal, provincial, and national transport authorities, regulatory entities, and associated transport appeals bodies, which does hold the potential of an improved road transport sector. The DA seek, sees the substantive provision of impartiality as a major step forward, while the optional establishment of municipal and provincial appeals bodies will bring this fun function much closer to stakeholders and affected parties involved. This, rather than the past situation of having appeals heard by something similar to the historical National Transport Commission. I thank you. Bye, Dr. Thank you, Honourable Member, the EFF. Chairperson, the proposal is to amend and act in order to empower the Transport Appeal Tribunal to take appropriate steps in cases where its rulings are not implemented or effected timelessly. 
to investigate delays in the completion of its proceedings and also to allow the minister to extend the term of office of the members of the tribunal. The powers given to the Transport Appeals Tribunal to impose time limits for the performing, for performing duty, duties to ensure implementation of the entity's decisions, to enforce compliance, and the power to investigate and act against parties who deliberately delay proceedings is most welcome. We support the changes in definitions and other areas for the bill to be in line with the National Land Transport Act of 2009. We also welcome the emphasis on appointment of members with expertise in transport, particularly in financial matters, because that is where corruption is right. However, it is rather alarming for the bill to provide that the DG must fix dates, times, and places of proceedings after consulting the tribunal appeal, the transport appeal tribunal, but not accommodate the predetermination of the number of sittings and the number of approved hours per sitting per year. We believe that for the sake of transparency, to avoid corrupt activities and proper budgeting, the Director General, in consultation with the chairperson of the tribunal, should be allowed to plan ahead and determine the number of sittings allowed for the tribunal and estimated number of hours per sitting in a financial year and the estimated preparation time for sittings. The EFF supports the bill. Thank you, Honorable Member. The IFP. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The, the transport sector has suffered from poor policies, regulations, and management. The Transport Appeal Tribunal vision is to promote much needed stability in the public transport sectors. It does this by pronouncing or deciding on appeals by public transport operators to facilitate a regulated public transport system. Therefore, the proper and efficient function of the tribunal is a central pillar to the ethical and effective functions of the department. Any matter relating to the tribunal are of great importance. Looking ahead to 2050, the great department is envisioned a different transport landscape for the country, a greater focus on integrated transport system, a revitalization rain sectors and the adoption of new technologies like electricity vehicles and green hydrogen have all communicated. Transport system will therefore need to be upgraded and integrated with emerging technologies. The department has said that it developed and plans must be aligned with changing and growing needs of passengers. Therefore, if the TAT is to function successfully, it must also be in line with the the development in public transport sector. The intention of the amendment contained with the bill reflect on understanding of changing context of public transport sectors. The process of public hearings and the amendment made after these hearings further highlights the contextual nature of the bill. The empowerment of the TAT to, to take up appropriate steps where its rulings are not implemented and to investigate delays in completion of this process, proceedings indications. Positive con co concrete measures to address the needs to, of operators and customer, customers in the, in the sectors. The tribunal must ex executive, execute its mandate without fear, favor, or prejudice. And no amount of, the, of interference should be tolerated. The IFP do support the bill. Thank you, Honourable Member. The FF Plus. The purpose of the amendment bill is also to bring the Act in line with developments since the implementation of the Act as a number of different pieces of legislation has been passed and needed to be connected to this legislation. It mark ook voorziening dat geschikte personen aangesteld wordt als leden van het tribunal en dat er genoeg kennis en ondervinding beschikt op verschillende terreinen zoals de economie 
rechte finansies, handel en openbare vervoer. Die wetsontwerp maak ook voorziening vir sekere machte van die tribunaal dat die raad niet meer as 9 lede en nie minder as 5 lede moet bestaan nie. Dit moet geschiet na oorlegpleging met elke lid van die uitvoerende raad in elke provincie wat verantwoordelijk is voor het padvervoer aangeweend het. Die minister mag die termijn van die lede van die tribunaal verleng. The bill was published for comments and submissions were received from Gout Train Management Agency. Speak English, please. No, honorable, honorable members, honorable members. But, On, no, 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 wait, honorable member. You see, the rules of parliament clearly allow for any member to converse in any of the official languages. And it's now the second time that the honorable Mpushe is interrupting proceedings. If you have a point of order, you must simply indicate and the table will alert me. May I ask the ANC whoops to talk to that honorable member, please? Yeah. Please proceed. The bill was published for comments and submissions were received from Gout Train Management Agency and the Western Cape Department of Transport and Public Works. Written comments were received. The Portfolio Committee adopted the report in the Transport Appeal Tribunal Bill with amendments and this was supported by all parties. The Freedom Front Plus supports the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The ACDP. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, we consider this bill against the backdrop of yet more carnage on our roads as 19 people, including six peoples, tragically died in two horrific collisions on Limpopo roads this past Friday. The ACDP extends its deepest condolences to the families of all the deceased, which, we, which include, we understand, children of ACDP members. Our thoughts and prayers are also with all those injured and we trust for their speedy recovery. Chair, the bill before us aims to empower the Transport Appeal Tribunal to take appropriate steps in cases where its rulings are not implemented or effected timorously and empower it to investigate delays in the completion of its proceedings. Sometimes when the TAT takes a decision imposing duties or th those, those decisions are not complied with and clause six will now uh, enforce and allow uh, implementation to take place. It also often happens that regulatory entities fail to implement or give effect to other rulings within the time specified and directives can now be issued in this regard. And it also sometimes happens that proceedings are delayed through frivolous, vexatious or irrelevant actions to delay proceedings. And again, clause eight of the bill will allow the TAT to investigate such delays. The ACDP supports these amendments and trust that they'll go some way to improve stability in public transport and reduce the number of fatal accidents on our roads. To conclude, Honorable Chair, and on a separate note, the ACDP today would like to wish the Jewish community well as they celebrate the festival of Purim today which as set out in the book of Esther commemorates the Jewish victory over Haman and all those who plotted the destruction of the Jewish people. May a similar fate before all those who plot the destruction of the Jewish people or the Jewish state of Israel. Haim Israel Chai, the people of Israel live. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. The UDM. No declaration, we support, Chair. Thank you. The ATM. Good. The NFP. Allow me, first of all, to extend on behalf of the National Freedom Party, our condolences to the family, friends, and the ANC at large on the tragic death of your former MEC for education in the Free State, Tate Maho. And also our condolences to his family and friends of the bodyguard that died in a tragic accident. But also, Chairperson, also allow me to express our concern about the accident that took place in Itegwini, Durban, and Slanga Rocks on the M41, where it's estimated about 56 motor vehicles were wiped out by, the, by this heavy duty vehicle that was going downhill. Uh, I think it clearly indicates that all is not well when it comes to our roads 
we need to pay more attention, attention. But more important, I think stringent conditions need to be put in place, particularly I think when it comes to the issuing of driver's licenses and the number of foreign nationals who might qualify in their own countries to drive, but not necessarily in South Africa and, and, and our roads. So I think it's something that we need to look at, but thank you very much for that. Um, now this uh, 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 bill, and report that is here before us was necessitated by the fact that there were limitations uh, currently as it stands. And so we want to welcome the work that has been done by the portfolio committee. Uh, and, I, and, and we do acknowledge that all processes were followed. There's been extensive submissions that were made by different stakeholders and that uh, uh, it is in the best interest particularly that this will be amended. And I think this will cause and create a lot more stability in the transport sector, but also enhance safety and, and ensure there's greater compliance. But very importantly, I think it will create an environment where there is delays, particularly when it comes to rulings, that this could be accelerated and it empowers the minister and others uh, to be able to deal with this uh, timelessly. So the National Freedom Party supports this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The AIC. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The, Nas the National Transport Appeal Tri Tribunal Amendment Bill seek to amend certain provisions of the Transport Appeal Tribunal Act, which was promul promulgated in 1998. The bill extends the powers of the Transport Appeal Tribunal and also provides for empowering mechanisms in respect of which delays by any party or entity performing the duty to ensure implementation of tribunal decisions will be sanctioned. The functions of the tribunal, such as dealing with appeals relating to applications for public road carrier permits and cross-border or cabotage permits, including hearing appeals from decisions made by the, provinci the, the provincial entities the cross-border road transport agencies, the regulatory committee, the national public transport regulator and the municipal regulator entities are retained. The main purpose of the tribunal is to create a fair and equitable envir environment through which appeals emanating from both from uh, public transport operators and the public transport regulators are treated fairly and efficiently. An efficient and impartial appeal process will only, I quote, improve the seamless flow by road of freight and passengers in the region, but also make a great contribution in respect of domestic and cross-border road transport, close quote. Our view, despite these concessions, is that the bill should have envisage a number of empowering dispute resolution mechanisms before certain powers, so before certain superpowers were transferred to the tri tribunal. This is important because challenges in road transport and passenger movement, including intra-regional trade blockages and fragmented cross-border pan-African infrastructure spillages on the adequacy and effectiveness of stakeholder management and cooperative governance systems. It is these cooperative and stakeholder initiatives which must be tightened up before jacking up the powers of the tribunal. We equally oppose the envisaged extension of team of, of term of office for members of the tribunal upon completion of their fixed term contracts. A non-renewable term of office yield independence. These extensions may be abused and will depend on the attitude of a member of the tribunal. This opens up process to abuse and lack of impartialities. We nonetheless support the bill. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. Cope, the PAC. Chair, the PAC supports the bill and thank you, Chair. Thank you. Al Jama. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable House Chair. Honorable House Chair, I'd like to congratulate the members of the Portfolio Committee for presenting uh, amendments 
uh, that is going to help us, especially with the uh, uh, opening of the borders when the intercontinental uh, trade, uh, Africa intercontinental trade, uh, each the countries of South Africa. So the cross-border agencies will play a, a very uh, important role. So Alzama will support uh, these amendments and we hope that if any regulations are passed, that it will take into account that very soon there will be years and years of prosperity in Africa as we open the borders and road transport will be very important uh, to get uh, into uh, country trade. I congratulate the Portfolio Committee because now we're going to have two bills where I don't have to hear the monotonous, uh, please note the objections of the DA, please note the objections of the uh, FMF, uh, please of next, uh, uh, note the objection of the ACDP. Uh, you know, uh, we don't want to hear that in Parliament, so we'd like to thank the uh, uh, Portfolio Committee for presenting a poll that is acceptable to most honourable members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Member. The ANC. Uh, thank you, Honourable Chairperson. The ANC support the Transport Appeal Tribunal Amendment Bill. The bill is critical for stakeholders in the transport sector. The transport sector plays a critical role in the movement of people, goods, freight, and service, and is therefore a major driver for economic efficiency and growth. Different forms of transport plays a critical role in various economic sector and is supported by different forms of transport in terms of road. The transport sector is also a major creator of both direct and indirect uh, jobs in different sectors of the economy. Infrastructure development as part of the implementation of the economic restructuring and recovery plan is also centered around transport, especially commuter transport to benefit working class and poor communities. Therefore, given the importance of the road and transport sector, there are many critical processes, process pieces of legislation and regulations which governs the transport sector. These are geared towards ensuring proper public road usage and more importantly, road safety licensing of transport operators it's a critical area for ensuring the high standards of vehicles, efficiency of the transport operator and cross-border permits. In this regard, while the previous act covered the licensing process, which could either be granted or could either refused on the basis of the legislation and regulations. However, the original act didn't allow for transport a appeal tribunal where transport operators could appeal the decision on licensing or permits if they were declined. And this forced the transport operators to go to court and which is expensive. The bill seeks to amend def definitions in the original act and to link all, all relevant transport legislations in terms of the National Land Transport Transportation Act and Cross-Border Transport Act. To enable the transport for regulatory authority and transport tribunal to operate within legal framework. Since its establishment, the Transport Appeal Tribunal has encountered a number of challenges that require amendment to the principal act. The principal act also require updating in respect of the development since 1998. It is against this backdrop that the Transport Appeal Tribunal Amendment Bill B8 2020 was introduced. The bill provides for 
certain powers of the transport appeal tribunal in terms of the composition of the board, not more than nine and not less than five. Its selection need to occur after consultation with every member of the executive council in every province responsible for road transport matters. Government stakeholders and private sector stakeholders were consulted at workshop which was held in Swane on the 26th and 27th February 2018. And written comments were received. In a participatory democracy, no legislation can succeed without public participation and the contribution of stakeholders and contribution of stakeholders. The portfolio committee is grateful and thankful to stakeholders and members of the public which assisted the committee to shape the framework by which we are governed in terms of legislation and regulation. It is what is well known to us as the African National Congress as the, and, and that the people shall govern. And this is the case with our government. In conclusion, the portfolio committee believes that it has done due diligence with a view of ensuring that shortcomings identified in the course of the implementation of the principal act have been addressed through the amendment to the principal act. The House to consider and adopt uh, this bill. The ANC support the bill. Here winner ANC 24, 2024 election. Here winner. Here winner ANC 2024 election. Here winner. Thank Don't you. you Thank you, honorable member. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, honorable member. Thank you. Order, honorable members, that certainly woke up everybody in the chamber. And now that we have your attention, I want to recognize the honorable deputy chief whip of the majority party. Thank you, honorable house chairperson. I move that the report be adopted. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? There's no objections agreed to. The secretary will read the fourth order. Second reading, Transport Appeal Tribunal Amendment Bill. Honorable members, as there is no list of speakers, are there any objections to the bill being read a second time? There's no objections. It's thus agreed to, and the secretary will read the bill a second time. Transport Appeal Tribunal Amendment Bill. Bill will be sent to the National Council of Provinces for concurrence. Honorable members, I now proceed to the motion on the order paper. You will recall that this debate took place last week. The item is thus a decision of question on the draft resolution in the name of the Honorable A.M. Sheikh Imam on the call for the downgrading of the South African Embassy in Israel until such time that Israel respects the rights of Palestinians. I wish to remind you again that this draft resolution was debated in a virtual mini plenary on Thursday, the 2nd of March, 2023, but that the decision thereon can only be taken in a full plenary. I now put the motion. Are there any objections to the motion being agreed to? The DA? Object. Object. Please, could you note the objections of the DA, Chair? It's noted, the IFP. Chairperson, please note the position of the IFP. Noted. Chair Order, honorable person, members. The Chair FF Plus. Please note the objection of the Freedom Front Plus, but we also call for a division. Please, Chair, please note the vociferous objection no, no, of the on, ACDP. Honorable, Thank you. honorable members, there is a call for a division, right? So let us grant that opportunity and the bells will be rung for five minutes. Recording stopped.
the rules, a manual voting procedure will be used for this division. Firstly, in order to establish a quorum, I would request the table to confirm that we have the requisite number of members physically present in the chamber and on the virtual platform to take this decision. Party whips will then be given an opportunity to confirm the number of their members present and indicate if they vote for. May I ask the two members on my left hand side who's in deep conversation there just to follow proceedings, please. Thank you. Party whips will then be given an opportunity to confirm the number of their members present and indicate if they vote for or against the question. A member who wishes to abstain or vote against the party vote may do so by informing the chairperson. Do we have a quorum present? Having confirmed that we have the requisite quorum, we will now proceed. The question before the House is that the draft resolution in the name of the Honorable A.M. Sheikh Imam on a call for the downgrading of the South African Embassy in Israel until such time Israel respects the rights of Palestinians be agreed to. Voting will now commence. Order, order, no, Papu, we'll get to that. Or we had the debate last week. The doors of the chamber will remain locked and members are not allowed to enter the platform, the virtual platform until voting is concluded. Whoops, can you confirm the number of your members present in the chamber and on the virtual platform? And also indicate if they vote for or against the question. The ANC. Online, Sna Snilkulu, Nemashum Lama Bili Nagune. Napagazi and Lini. Snemashumilas Planu Nagbili. E total Gubangle Likulu, Mashumilas Kombis and Stupa. Sial Sagela, Les Sugumiso, Sa Salemoshin, Nebo. The DA House Chair, there are 19 members in the House, 56 on the platform. 75 in total opposing the motion. The EFF. House Chair, we are 10 in the House and 17 on the platform. Thank you. How are you voting? I'm voting yes. Yes. Thank you. The IFP. Chairperson, five online, three in the House, total of eight voting against. Thank you. The FF plus. Thank you, Chairperson. We are four in the House, four on the platform. That's a total of eight voting against. The ACDP. Thank you, House Chair. We one on the platform, two in the House, vociferously voting against. Thank you. The UDM. One on the virtual platform, the virtual voting platform. in favor. Yeah. The ATM. Good. The NFP. One in the house in support, chairperson. The AIC. One on the virtual platform voting in support, chair. Cope. The PAC. PAC is voting in support, chair. Al Jama. Uh, Al Jama has one in the house, and Al Jama supports uh, this. Motion. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. I think the member mean on the virtual platform. So one on the that's virtual correct, platform. Correct, Order. Uh, thanks for the correction. Order, Honorable yeah, Members. Order. As well. Order. Order, Honorable Members. Anyone can make a mistake as to where they are. Is there a member that wishes to abstain or vote differently to their party? None, the voting session is now closed.
Honourable Members, order. The outcome of the division is as follows. There's no abstentions, 94 voted against the motion, 208 voted in favour of the motion. The motion is therefore agreed to. Order, Honourable Members. The Secretary will read the last order of the day. Debate on International Women's Day, a year of decisive action to advance women's rights in South Africa, Africa, and the world. Thank you. The Honorable April H.G. Honorable the House Chair, geacht hij is voorzitter, ik is een man geboren uit een vrouw. Ik is een pa van een wonderlijke dochter. Ik heb een oma gehad, wie van die lieflijkste koeksisters kon bak. En ik is een man wat staan voor die rechten van vrouwen. Tomorrow we join the global community in celebrating International Women's Day. A day that is born out of the struggle for freedom is championed by the international working class movement. The observation of this day comes from the historic New York March of 1908, where women called for shorter hours, higher pay and opportunity to vote. This historic day has laid a foundation for many struggles that would be waged across the world advocating for social justice generally and women's justice specifically. The global outlook of International Women's Day as we have come to observe it now and historically such that it is embedded in the struggles of ordinary women who resisted an authority that sought to make them invisible at best and destroy them at worst. The history of International Women's Day cannot be divorced from the broader struggle against exclusion of people from opportunities and the silencing of the voices based on gender, race, and class. The South African Women Movement has also been immersed in the politics and organizing akin to that scene through the early 1900s when the International Women's Movement was birthed. As a nation, our democracy is also embedded in the activism of women who have played a very critical role in our shaping of our politics and activism against the despotic colonial apartheid regime that aimed at oppressing both women and blacks in general. South African women from 1913 were disconnected with the apartheid past law policies that made them invisible and inferior to men. Inspired by the African nationalist politics with the South African Natives National Congress, women confronted the oppressive regime led by heroines such as Charlotte McKegge, Ms. A.S. Kabashe, 
and Ms. Kotsi and Kate, Katie Lowe, who among other things carried a 5,000 signature petition that was demanding that the rights of women be recognized and burning passes at municipal offices as an act of defiance to the system. The political work against entrenched patriarchy and racism of the apartheid regime was continuous with the United Democratic Front marshalling and organizing women across the country for a better and more equal future. In light of this, an important turning point in history of women in South Africa is when Women's March of 9 August 1956, where women of various races, ethnicities and class held a march to the union buildings in Pretoria in protest of the oppressive past laws that restricted movement for many, around 20,000 women are believed to have participated in this march, led by comrades such as Mam Sophie the Brain, Albertina Sisulu, Lilian Ngoy, Rahima Musa, and Helen Joseph, an important legacy for our nation and women's movement globally. These women and the events in history Books of the women's movement in South Africa have played an important role in creating a basis for women's issues to be considered important in the context of nation building and the strengthening of democracy. One of the key areas that we should note uh, how the ANC government's program has since the democratic dispensation been at the forefront of advancing issues related to women inclusion and representation. The Women's Charter of 1954, and the Women's Charter for, Charter for Effective Equality have been instrumental in advancing some of the gains for all women, specifically for Black working class women who carry decades of structural exclusion that reinforces their position as vulnerable. In general, the status of women over the last 29 years of South Africa's democracy has significantly improved. However, it is challenged by the reality and the persistence of economic disparities and gender-based violence and femicide. Government policy and the work of institutions focused on gender equality, such as Commission for Gender Equality, continue to play a pivotal role in prioritizing women's representation and inclusion in leadership. The specific focus on women through the Ministry of Women, Children, and People Living with Disabilities in the presidency is important. It should, it should continue to be used to prioritize the streamlining of women's issues through a strategic approach that integrates the work of government to improve the lives of South Africans. In the spirit of renewal and advancement of women's rights, the ANC remains committed to the historical principle that women's rights are human rights and will do all that is required to use the state as a vehicle for the advancement and the protection of women's rights. The pandemic on gender-based violence and femicide is a global phenomenon Several statistics by international institutions have reported that globally, one in three women have been beaten, coerced into sex, and abused in some other way, usually by someone they know. As many as 38% of murders of women globally are committed by their intimate partners. This is a testament to a social norm that impacts the world and thus requires an international response to change. As a nation, we have made strides, through the introduction of legislation in this very parliament. Sex crimes, particularly pedophilia, it also proposes to expand the ambit of the crime of incest and introduces a new offense of sexual intimidation. The Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Bill aims to address gender-based violence, uh, violence and offenses committed against vulnerable persons and provide for addition procedures to reduce secondary victimization of vulnerable persons in court proceedings. The new law expands the circumstances in which a, compliant, a complainant can give evidence through intermediaries and provides the evidence through audiovisual links in proceedings other than criminal proceedings. This legislation also tightens bail and minimum sentencing provisions in the context of gender-based violence. The Domestic Violence Amendment Bill and legislation includes new definitions such as controlling behavior and coercive behavior and expands existing definitions such as domestic violence to include spiritual abuse, morotis that are naughty. Uh, it includes them, elder abuse, 
controlling behavior and exposing subjecting children to certain listed behaviors. The Domestic Violence Amendment Bill introduces online applications for protection order against acts of domestic violence and imposes obligations on functionaries in the Department of Health and Social Development to provide certain services to victims of domestic violence. These are decisive measures to strengthen the fight against gender violence and femicide. Women must know their rights so they can protect themselves. Some of you must even go for karate lessons. In today's digital age, cyberbullying is another prevalent practice that violates many women's human rights worldwide. Cyberbullying sometimes dehumanizes some women by spreading personal information and private content. Social media and other digital platforms have become spaces of content where women's uh, uh, pictures get sent around in a way that is dehumanizing. We should use artificial intelligence developments to, to orientate and harness society that uh, and harness a society that promotes women's human rights. We must transform our society and the behavior of boys, men, and fathers as it, as it is our behavior which will create an environment of safety for women of our nation and generally around the globe. We must adapt several cultural practices in line with human rights as some contribute to creating gender stereotypes and practices which oppress women and impact people around the world. We want to send our solidarity to the women of Palestine who suffer under the apartheid government of Israel, which continues to oppress the Palestinians and annex the land. We pledge solidarity with all women violated and impacted by wars, as women are the most vulnerable in conflicts worldwide. In line with the global international Women's Day theme of Digital, innovation and technology for gender equality. As a nation, we should focus on promoting maths and science and technology subjects enrollment by girls and women in higher education and training. The digital economy and technological developments can be exclusionary if women are not involved in these sectors. Digital, uh, thank you. Uh, let us continue to work together to create a non-sexist society where men and women enjoy equal rights. It cannot be that in this year of 2023, women are still getting paid less than men for the same jobs that they are doing. It is something that we must fight as men. Women's battles can never be about women alone. It must include us as men, ons as papas, ons as brewers, ons as nephews, moet weet that your sister is my sister and your ma is my ma. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Member. The Honorable Gigi Opperman. You don't need to look further than Parliament to determine how much is being done to advance women's rights in South Africa. Right now, we have a cabinet minister accused of sexual assault at Kruger National Park. We have a police minister who recently said that a victim was lucky to be raped only once. An ANC MP was accused and arrested for allegedly killing his wife in November. We have derogatory public utterances by cabinet ministers saying things like, educated men don't rape. Our femicide statistics are five times the international average, as high as that of war-torn countries. It increased with 52% in the first quarter of 2021-22, and we have the highest incidence of rape in the world. In South Africa spandeer ons 447 rand per dag op een gevangene, 17 rand 50 op een kind in een kris en slechts 5 rand per dag op een vrouw in een skeiling. Dit is tragisch om een vrouw sy traumatische ervaring te reduceer tot rand en cent, maar hoe anders sal hierdie regering die financiële implicaties van onderbevondste skeilings verslag of verspan geweld verstaan? 
Ons land sit met baie beperkende regulaties en wetgeving, wat die bevordering van vrouwenrechten kniehalter. Tans in Suid-Afrika bepaal die staatsdienstwerkerfonds dat de vrouw slechts gerechtig is op 50% van haar manse maandelijkse pensioen zou hy tot sterven kom. Die departement sociale ontwikkeling het de regulatie in sake getrouwde pensionarissen. Daar volgens kry die vrou minder as die jaafte van haar manse toela, want die gesamentle Gesamentlijke huishoudelijke inkomsten mag niet een zekere bedrag oorskrijgen. Recent stats SA data shows that women are lagging behind in terms of socio-economic opportunities. Black women in particular are the most vulnerable with an unemployment rate of 38.3%. More than 4 in 10 females are not in employment, education or training. We need to outlaw child marriage. We must bravely engage the customary law debates around Ukutualo in Tombi. We banned female genital mutilation in South Africa. Let's now fight for it to be criminalized in Guinea, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Mali, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. We must include obstetric violence as a form of GBV. Many women in this country had forced and coerced medical procedures such as sterilization and C-sections without their consent. Many still are denied care and health systems and are assaulted and neglected during childbirth and pregnancy. We have to advocate for safe relinquishment of babies and legalize safe havens as an alternative to unsafe baby abandonment in South Africa. Many babies are found in open fouts, rubbish bins, shopping bags, toilets and rubbish dumps because it is illegal for a mother to safely relinquish her baby. Unsafe abandonment must always be a crime, but we need a safe alternative. The law in its current form is purely reactive, and it is estimated that 10,000 children are abandoned annually, most of them found already dead. The Frauen van Zuid-Afrika is put it van presidentiële taakspanne, kielvol van commissies. Terwijl drie vrouwen streed, steeds elke eer gewelddadig vermoor word. Ons is op van lauwwarm beloftes. Ons soek antwoorde, bevondsing, implementering en ons soek koppe wat rol. Thank you very much, honorable member. Honorable Sonjana. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson. House Chairperson, let me first start by greeting the Commander in Chief, Commissars, and our Ground Forces of the EFF. First and foremost, I would like to start by saying that, Chairperson, historically, the struggle for emancipation of humanity and emancipation of women, in particular, has always been led by socialist organization. The very origin of the International Women's Day are rooted in the socialist struggle for emancipation, for full recognition of women's rights in the workplace and everywhere else in society. It was the Socialist Party of America that shook the Western world when in 1908, a 15,000 strong army of progressive women led a march across New York City to demand reasonable working hours for women, to demand equal pay for the same work and to demand comprehensive rights for women. It was the same party that declared the 28th of February in 1909 as a National Women's Day to highlight the struggles that women faced. Then in 1910, Clara Zetkin, who was the leader of the Women's League of the Socialist Democratic Party in Germany at the International Conference of Working Women, it was at this conference that the idea of an International Women's Day was decided. This was done to highlight the struggle of women across the world, to bring attention to the urgent need of affirming the human right of women to eradicate workplace discrimination on the basis of gender and to affirm the leadership role of women across all sectors of society. Today, very little has changed globally in the continent and in this country. It was in recognition of these challenges that in the EFF founding manifesto, we clearly state that 
the EFF would strive to realize women's liberation through a variant of interventions from education against patriarchy and sexism to legislation and the close monitoring of the implementation of the same in order to realize women's empowerment in society, the family and the workplace. The EFF believes that the gender-based violence and related antisocial activities are reinforced and even sustained by the deplorable condition of our people. Therefore, a key to a female emancipation, emancipation is the emancipation of all. The EFF will emphasize transforming the lives of our people in the ghettos from one of the generalized structural violence as a mechanism to end all violence, including violence against women. In this country, women still earn about 35% less than men for doing the same job. Over 40% of the household in this country are led by women. And these homes are significantly poorer than those with the male figurehead. Apart from poverty and economic exclusion, the most heinous of the injustices faced by women in this country must be the violence that is enabled by the state on women. Just between October and December last year, there were over 15,000 reported cases of sexual assault and over 12,000 cases of rape. Most of these cases will not result in any successful prosecution, least of all arrest. This is because the police service has, has its capacity eroded because of incompetent men now leading it. The police have failed the family of Nam Tham Twa, whose murder and abuse at the hands of her then boyfriend, Major Beku Zulu, was highlight, highly publicized in the country. Despite this, the police have completely given up on ever finding her killer, as they have given up on finding those who have raped over 50,000 women every single year in this country. We urge women of this country to come out in their numbers on the 20th of March to close down this country and march for jobs and march for the economic emancipation and march for the end of these crimes against women and march for a better capacitated police services and march for the better healthcare for sexual and reproductive healthcare services for women. Only a progressive socialist state will guarantee a progressive realization of this right. And the state is only possible under the EFF government in this country. Chairperson, I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable M.G. Sangwa. The Honorable M.G. Sangwa from the IFP. Chairperson? No. No. Honorable member, I have taken it. Chairperson, let me read Mark Lingua's uh, debate on her behalf. I think she's having connection issues. Can I proceed? Please do. Thank you. Honorable Chairperson, International Women's Day on 8 March, much like South Africa's Women's Day on 9 August, is about highlighting the issues women face and the distance we still have to go to achieve gender equality. We are still all entitled as human to human rights, which include the right to live free from violence and discrimination, to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, to be educated, to own property, to vote, and to earn an equal wage. However, across the globe, many women and girls still face discrimination based on sex and gender, Gender inequality underpins many problems which disproportionately affect women and girls, such as domestic and sexual violence, lower pay, lack of access to education and inadequate health care. While we can lament the inequalities faced by women for years on end, I welcome the pragmatic theme of our debate today. Contrary to what has been shown by our government, women's issues are not soft issues that can be treated as additional matters, but must be taken very seriously. South African women need government to take 
decisive and substantive action to protect them. More than a year ago, on 28 January 2022, President Ramaphosa signed three new GBV laws aimed at strengthening efforts to fight gender-based violence into law. The Criminal Law Amendment Act, the Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Act, and the Domestic Violence Amendment Act. While these pieces of legislation are crucial, I question how effective they can be considering the lack of urgency which, with, with which it is implemented. Following the president's sign off of these laws, violent crimes committed against women and children were once again recorded at alarmingly high and unacceptable levels. From April to June 2020, 855 women and 243 children have been murdered in our country. Over 11,000 assault cases with the intent to do grievously bodily harm to female victims were opened with the police and 1,670 such cases involved children. By July and September of 2022, attempted murder of women increased by 10.6% and assault with the intent to do grievous bodily harm increased by 15.9%. Therefore, my question becomes what decisive action in relation to passing the passing of legislation will be taken to stop women from being murdered. It is clear that our government needs to stop paying lip service to the fight against violence against women and children, uh, against gender inequality fast enough to achieve our goals. My suggestion is that government starts by actioning these laws they pass, such as paying cl closer attention to the need for the National Register for Sex Offenses and actually clear, clearing up the DNA backlog. Perpetrators of gender-based violence, murders and rapists have no place in our society. It is time for government to give effect to chapters two of our constitution, especially section 11, 10 and 12. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Jenner. Thank you, House Chairperson. House Chairperson, the theme for this year's International Women's Day is a year of decisive action to advance women's rights in South Africa, Africa and the world. However, measured against the current social circumstances and other stumbling blocks faced by women in South Africa, I am appalled that the ANC government of today is actually claiming success in this regard. The Akbar April said to speak at a very beginning, but I know that I'm not going to sleep in the night. Let's just look at the so-called decisive action in South Africa only because charity starts at home. What decisive action has been taken to advance women's rights in this country by this government that has actually worked? The National Strategic Plan on GBV and Femicide was published on 11 March 2020, and that's where it stopped. Quarter on quarter, GBV and femicide has been increasing at an alarming rate. According to the police minister, the first quarter of 2022 was especially brutal for women and children with double di digit increases. In the third quarter of 2022, the minister again stated that high levels of abuse and murder of women were worrying and unacceptable. And again, for the fourth quarter, crime statistics revealed a brutal spike in attacks against women and children. Honorable April, I find it very amusing that you find this funny. Is this funny? because it's, it's a very serious matter. Has the so-called decisive action of preventing and fighting GBV and femicide been taken to advance women's rights? No, Honorable House Chair, it has not. Economic empowerment of women is another decisive action that could and should have been taken to advance women's rights. Maar het het ook nie gebeur nie. Suid-Afrika se kwynende ekonomie, een lewenskoste krisis weens van die swakste dienstlevering in die wereld, beerkrag, bedrog en corruptie, hoë brandstof en voedselpryse en werkloosheid kelder die ekonomiese bemachtiging van vrouwe in Suid-Afrika. En voor wie se deur moet dit gele word? Unemployment in South Africa is another crisis that does immeasurable damage to the goal of women empowerment. At 42.6% and measured against the world average of 6.1%, we have the highest unemployment rate in the world, which is twice that of Somalia, a war-torn country. You expressed your sympathy with women in war-torn countries, but we have more than Somalia's unemployment rate. When women, women are also 
those who suffer most under unemployment, a crisis that is compounded by the gender pay gap that you have also mentioned, but what has your government been doing for 30 years? The energy crisis and rolling blackouts that have been exclusively created by ANC trough feeding is another burden on women empowerment. A lack of electricity does not only hamper job creation and economic growth, it also exacerbates unpaid reproductive labor, like domestic work and caregiving that usually falls to women, creating time poverty and preventing them from earning an income and empowering themselves. No decisive action there either. So I say this with as much respect as I can muster. Stop taking the credit for something that you have not done and get your act together. You can start by the decisive action of getting rid of the new minister of women in the presidency and her redundant department. But as vrouwe sake soos die COVID-19 pandemie bestuur gaan word, sien ek vir ons allemaal swaarigheid voor. On this International Women's Day, the FF Plus chooses to rather celebrate ordinary women and their extraordinary achievements. For those who have empowered themselves and others, we salute you. I thank you, House Chair. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Honourable Member. Honourable Chairperson. I firstly wish to pay tribute to the first lady and co-founder of the African Christian Democratic Party, our Dr. Lydia Meshwe, who left a legacy to be emulated by Christian women in leadership and in politics. Dr. Lydia Meshwe was a practical Pentecostal and a fierce defender of the biblical worldview, a custodian of the vision of a transformed South Africa and Africa through biblical transformation. The restoration of the family as a cornerstone for social stability, the belief in the ownership of divine destiny, not only of individuals, but of nations, and in particular, our beloved country, South Africa. When we consider the theme of this debate, the ACDP wants to reflect and ask the question, how does a government who views itself to be serious about the rights of women pursue the, le the le legalization of prostitution? This proposed legislation that deems prostitution work, which it is not, will become law in a lawless country that is overrun by organized crime. A country where 82 murders are committed per day that ranks as one of the most violent countries for children to grow up in. Prostitution by nature promotes violence against women. And wherever it was legalized, human trafficking has increased. This comes from research done in Nordic countries, the very same research that shows the severe psychological and emotional scarring of those who are forced by circumstance beyond their control into the nets of pimps and madams. The rights of women to dignity and agency are violated in activities that reduces them to mere objects to be used and abused for the pleasure of the buyer. Chairperson, this parliament, is a stone's throw away from the old slave lodge where women were violated and had no agency over their own bodies and choices. This government, by its aggressive pursuance of this legislation, to give legitimacy to an illegal industry that thrives on the vulnerability and economic deep deprivation of women is admitting its own inability to realize the Freedom Charter, its foundational document. It is a tragedy that today, 200 years after the end of slavery, within a few hundred meters of the slave lodge, where women of color were forced into what is now being called sex work, legislation can make its way into this parliament to renew that, that practice. I want to speak to the speaker who referred to Israel. Let me state, don't be selective in application of critique. Include the women of Iran fighting and dying for freedom or the women and children in China who work under appalling conditions to mention just a few examples. I thank you. Amen. Member. Hello. Honorable Kwangwa. Oh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, House Chair. Oh, my, my, my apologies. Go ahead, Honorable Pangwa. Oh, thank you, sir. 
Honorable Chair, Chairperson, South African women continue to face some of the highest levels of domestic and sexual violence of uh, any women found anywhere in the world. They face, uh, they need equality, safety, decent jobs, equal opportunities, and equal economic and political participation. However, the country is taking forever to unite and build momentum in order to find urgent solutions to the challenges facing women. As you know, we're even surprised that uh, even in the context of this theme where we're talking about decisive action to advance women's rights, there's absolutely no clear action plan apart from tightening up legislation, but there's no coordinated program in our view where government works together uh, with civil society groups and other related stakeholders to set a clear agenda that will advance women's rights and ensure gender equality in South Africa. Even when one looks at the state of the nation of President Ramaphosa's speech, he spoke about many social ills. However, the speech did not contain any concrete and effective plan to cap inequality and GPV in South Africa, as you know. Women's problems are not addressed in our view urgently. Right now, there are helpless women in Afghanistan whose rights are being obliterated. Girls are prohibited from attending school. Women are banned from work. They are forced to work only, in, only, only appear in public with a male. Children are forced to marriages, for example. These are many, there are also many women who are traumatized in Ethiopia whose bodies were used as battlefield in the battlefield during the Tigray war. They were kept in camps as sexual captives for most uh, for the most sexual atrocities that occur to them. Not only that, there are women and children who are disproportionately impacted by the armed conflict in Palestine. However, there doesn't seem to be even globally, even continentally here in Africa, to be a coordinated plan to deal with the challenges facing women. When we had a meeting of AFRIPA in Tanzania in December, one of the issues that human rights activists spoke to us about a pressing challenge for Tanzania from a human rights perspective was one of gender-based violence, but it does, there doesn't seem to be a cross-pollination of ideas between the different member states of the African continent on how to tackle and deal with first gender equality and human rights challenges and violations facing women on our continent. We need to do better as one of the leading economies in Africa, but also as a continental leader that has always had a reputation of exporting democracy and human rights to the rest of the world. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. ATM. Good. The Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, House Chairperson. Malibongwe. <laughs> House Chairperson, allow me first of all to take this opportunity <clears throat> of thanking those who stood up to protect human rights, not just in South Africa, like the woman of 1956, but the decision you took today to protect the human rights of the people of Palestine. So thank you very much to the African National Congress. Indeed, you have today articulated that you are the champions of human rights. Let me also thank the Economic Freedom Fighters for your contribution, your support, and upholding human rights. The United Democratic Movement, let me also thank you for your unwavering support in protecting human rights, not being motivated by money, by self-interest, but indeed you have shown today in the two seats that you hold how independent you are in your thinking and your vision for a better world. I thank you. To the AIC, once again, I thank you for your contribution in fighting for human rights. As our former leader, Tata Mandela said, and always said that we cannot be free unless the people of Palestine are free. And yes, indeed, 
our former leader will be resting in peace today. But let me also pay tribute to my former leader, Zanela Magwaza Msibi, in an unwavering support for the people of Palestine. And let us not forget about the atrocities that she had to go through as a woman that we are talking about, woman today, that led to her forming the National Freedom Party. And I personally have been a, 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 a one of the witnesses to that. <clears throat> let me also thank the PAC, Al Jama, for your contributions, as usual, in upholding the rights of our people worldwide and not being deterred by the dependence that some people believe that we may have on some of these countries. I said it before and I'll say it again. African continent has everything and it's in the control of somebody else. Let us not forget the role of Israel in breaking the sanctions in the apartheid together with the IFP of the days of apartheid. Let us not forget it. But on the issue of women, I want to say, I want to congratulate the woman and the contribution you have made to liberate South Africa and where we are today. In fact, many of you are leading by example. I want to say continue with that good work, continue with uplifting human rights and the rights of women here. Many will come here and talk about women, but when they go back home, they undermine their women. Thank that you very much. Thank Honorable you very much, Chairperson. The Honorable Ngaba. Uh, thank you, House Chairperson. For nearly 30 years, the NC-led government has failed to advance the rights of women in South Africa. It is very shameful that the NC-led government has failed to make the country safe for women. According to the global survey conducted by the medical technology company, Hologic, more than 70% of women in South Africa do not feel safe walking alone at night. South Africa has high levels of violence against women. Our country has amongst the highest rape incidents in the world. As South African men, we have a role to play in the fight against gender-based violence. We must be active participants in the fight against this sketch. House Chairperson, the reality of the matter is that the Minister of Police has failed to ensure the safety of women in our country. In fact, we have a Minister of Police who believes that women are lucky to be raped once. This is the very same Minister of Police who is supposed to protect women and ensure that their right to be free from all forms of violence is respected. As a country, we surely cannot be able to advance the rights of women if we still have people like this as our leaders. How is it that Mr. Peggy Tele is still the Minister of Police when he has failed dismally? South African women deserve better. Women with disabilities have also been neglected by this uncaring ANC-led government. The Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities has failed to fast track the development of the Disability Rights Bill. This piece of legislation will have gone a long way in advancing the rights of women with disabilities in our country. There are still many barriers preventing women with disabilities from being active participants in the country's economy. We cannot talk about advancing the rights of women in South Africa without talking about the empowerment of some of the most vulnerable women in South Africa, women with disabilities. These are the women that have been left behind and disempowered by the failures of this uncaring government. This government has also failed to get many women out of poverty. It is common knowledge that female-headed households are vastly poorer than male-headed households. With the rising cost of living, millions of South African women are suffering from hunger and unemployment. They are missing meals. They are unable to provide for themselves, their children, and the elders in their household. If the government was serious about women empowerment and advancing the rights of women in South Africa, then it will immediately drop fuel levies and increase the zero rated food baskets. This will provide great relief to thousands and thousands of South African women who are struggling to put food on the table. Now is the time 
for the government to start taking the empowerment of women seriously. Now is the time for this government to ensure that the rights of women in our country are protected and advanced. Now is the time for this government and especially the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities to start looking into the plight of women with disabilities in our country. Thank you, House Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Honorable Piri. Yo. My camera. Welcome, Honorable Member. Yalla <laughs> Ritile mo ya tapile sicha. Sicheba di bulela ngona ke di tseba di mo go bane. Rena bi ya loka le khotla la badimo le batho. Re tseba go ya tapile sicha. E bile sicha ba sa rena se khona go bona lo o kwishisha gore re di yakatsela tshotlhe gore re tla re khona go ba thusha. Tjatjila le khone ke tjatjila bomme le tjatjile go le long gore rena ha re le tshe le fase. Bi ya loka le khotla la badimo le batho re re mudzura tshiduro ndwa ya mboforo ya bafuma kadzi asi ndwa ya rushaka fedzi ndi ndwa ya dzichaka bafuma kadzi le fasilot batangana na milao ya khetulu mikwa nando nando welo nga ndira dzo fambana nao usika chichaba chie danao zwi zwa nga manda eh zwi toda chandulo ya politiki ine ya bea vathu ba Chinna ni fetu hanta ufiraba fumakati. Usae dana hambeu lifasini jika di kwa ondanga manda. Ritendera na nabobo amba ufira. Kamu vigo wa jino wa, 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 wa shango lote lifasini. Kama jango a, a 86. Bafumakati wa kaditanga na, na, na nyirezo ya mishu mungeno mashango na 95. Wusa purufe ziswi mihoro, ee danao ya mishumo, na ngoba chita mishumo ee danao. Izi zia dana na 2,4 billion wabafuma kazi. Basa ko e, neke zwao e, zikukara kana mishumo ee danao ene ya ba. Mzura chuduro, in our continent Africa, women continue to be marginalized due to the patriarchal nature of our society, like elsewhere worldwide. Women bear the brunt of unpaid labor in their household and are deprived of their rights to own land in many countries, particularly in rural areas. Unemployment affects women more. And in South Africa, women have the most extended unemployment period. 42% of children lived only with their mothers, while a much smaller percentage of 4% lived only with their fathers. This is an indication that as part of advancing the human rights of women, fathers have a role to play to ensure that all women enjoy their freedom by taking equal responsibility in raising their children. And the Working environment in many regards are not designed to meet the needs of women. And we must continue to advocate for women condition that consider women's social responsibilities. We need to have laws which recognize the various social obligation of women and their well-being. Bafuma ka zivanji na mita na nga shpinga cha zino. Vodi tika nga bulimi. Nge no bafuma ka zivanji vachi ketururiwa. Vasi na panero zote yao na ukona usikerera ndanguro ya mavu ya zichaba ni zinji. Usaba hone na tikezo ya yote ya oya bafuma kazi na, 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 na mbele ziso 
ya bulimisi jifura shango kanyaruo ya sektara ya bulimi. Ine ya bayo edanao kau shera mrenje, kau sika mishumu. Mchimbi za mshumu. The ANC has placed women empowerment as a critical aspect of social transformation. Our strategic object objective of creating a non-sexist non social South Africa is premised on creating a gender equal society through developing policies and laws that promote women empowerment in our economy as owners of businesses and as preferred workers. This has transformed South Africa such as it has become a norm in many of our communities that women own assets and can survive independently. Today, women are doctors, lawyers, engineers, professors, scientists, pilots, and various professions that continue to dominate, to be dominated by women. Women today constitute the highest percentage of student and higher education graduates. This is a democratic gain of the ANC policies, which have opened doors uh, of learning. Uh, I believe you are listening attentively, the DA. Closing the assets and income gender inequality gap will contribute to addressing various forms of oppression that women face due to dependency on men. Breaking this cycle of oppression is critical for women's freedom and human rights. This is not an incident of history, but democratic gains, which are a product of the, in, the ANC policies we, and internationally. Despite the progress, women remain undeprived and marginalized in various sectors of economy and critical strategic leadership responsibilities. We are here as women parliamentarians. We welcome the pronouncement by the president that 40% of government procurement expenditure should be spent on women-owned enterprises. This will go a long way in promoting and empowering uh, women-owned enterprises. The private sector is, a vit is vital in advancing women's economic empowerment and closing gender in income inequalities. Private sector plays need to start reporting to on their women empowerment effort and ensure all companies have a strategy to promote and empower women's ownership management and control in the economy. We call on the government to take serious decisive steps to address the problem of inequality, pay between men and women equally. The equal work for equal pay principle address the gender pay gap. We equally welcome the, the strides of our government in promoting the provision of social housing of women for women, which is critical for the protection against base, gender-based violence and femicide, which is prevalent amongst partners then through harassment and other forms. As a society, we need to recognize that addressing the gender-based violence and femicide pandemic require the entirely entirety of humanity. It requires us to praise the boy, to raise the boy child differently so they appreciate women as their equals. It, is require, it requires us to assess some of our culture and religious practice that can oppress women. We need to continue to pass legislation that oblige the state and other social institution to gender women empowerment. Government men support many civil society organization and non-profit organization, non-governmental, non-organizational, which have a significant role in pushing back the rise of gender-based violence in our society through awareness and support for victims. Therefore, we call on this organization to be accountable to the people and ensure that the continent and committed to, co to fight against this pandemic and I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Honorable Chapter. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. In celebrating this year's International Women's Day, we wish to take a detour and look at uh, Rwanda state and uh, what leaf we can take from the country's progressive women empowerment culture. Rwanda has taken leave from Article 11 of the 
Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The article provides that states parties shall take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in the field of employment in order to ensure on a basis of equality of men and women, the same, right, the same rights in particular. The right to the same em employment opportunities, including application of the same criteria for selection in matters of employment. The right to free choice of profession and employment, the right to promotion, job security, and all benefits and conditions of service, and the right to receive vocational training and retraining, including apprenticeship, advanced vocational training, and recurrent training. The Global Competitive Report of 2017-2018 ranked Rwanda on female participation in the workforce, the second in the world. South Africa, on the other hand, ranked 72 on the same score. Countries such as Canada, South Africa, and the United States uh, of America have been referred to as the beacon of constitutional and human rights law. Yet the US, Canada, and South Africa all left behind Rwanda on female participation. For a country that was once rocked by tribalism and acts of terror against its women, Rwanda became the lodestar of our creative spirit. We also know that a new constitution passed in 2003 in Rwanda decreed 30% of parliamentary seats be reserved for women. The government also pledged that girls' education would be encouraged and the women be given leadership roles in the community and in key institutions. The story of Rwanda is one that which inspires confidence, Honorable Chair, and one only needs to look at, at the makeup and ratio of the Rwandan parliament to make sense of all this. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Cope. PAC. The Honorable Hendricks. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Alchie. Honorable House Chair, on the eve of International Women's Day, Al Jamal would like to compliment the ANC Women's League for uh, uh, advancing the rights of women. Women who are harmed, the first people on the scene will be members of the uh, ANC Women's League. I think it's time that women unite and that the ANC Women's League invite uh, women from nations of other political parties. Because there are women in other political parties who will make very good uh, 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 cabinet ministers. And maybe then uh, some women of other political parties would have been accommodated in the region and in Suffolk. Honorable House Chair, the first leader of parliament was a woman. And she has advocated for equal, uh, pay for equal work of equal value. So now we have a new uh, leader of parliament, but it's a man. And we hope that he will follow our example. We also hope that the new Minister of Sports won't do the Safa blunder by underpaying women uh, who play excellent soccer, have won tournaments and they haven't won any. Uh, and we know that in 227 there will be a women's soccer tournament that the Minister will set the groundwork so that there's equal pay for equal women in sport. Honorable Archie, we would like to proceed to the ANC Women's League to speed up in one way or another, the amendments of the Maintenance Act. It cannot be that men get money to go to maintenance court to defend themselves. It is time that women also get money for transport to go to maintenance court. Also, it cannot be that some women are denied access to the divorce court because they are in a religious marriage or in a Muslim marriage. It cannot be that women don't get the marriage certificate and when their husbands die, they face all, all kinds of, of, of problems. So uh, in many rural communities, uh, in many communities, especially in rural villages, women continue to bear the brunt of water collection and provision. al works in 50 village, villages, so we know what we talk about. They spend many days, many hours a day collecting water for the family uh, and are often exposed to dangers such as sexual violence and health risks. We appeal to the Minister of Water and Sanitation 
to lessen the load of uh, women. They can't spend their whole day carrying water for the bin to take a bath. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Poldani. Women of South Africa are bleeding from holding the knife by its sharp end. We have held on for so long, hoping for better days. Election after election, we are sold dreams that our votes will translate to our development and realization of women's rights. We are not yet Uhuru. The National Development Plan released in 2011 is gathering dust. The NDP was positioned as a blueprint for tracking South Africa's challenges. This long-term vision and plan for the country aims to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by 2030. The NDP envisioned that by 2030, people living in South Africa should have no fear of crime. Women, children, and vulnerable groups should feel protected. We are far from this realization. Policy papers mean nothing if they bring no change. The UN report on gender equity in 2030, the Agenda for Sustainable Development, notes that on reducing inequality, single mother households are especially at risk of living below 50% of the national income. In South Africa, 43% of single mother households fall within this 50% mark. The same report records that 43% of females are food insecure in South Africa. A stuck 17.7% against Zimbabwe. Now take a minute to digest that. The DA's economic justice policy, which is based on sustainable development goals model, warns that the breakdown in the family structure places the sharing of childcare responsibilities as critical to the professional and economic prospects of women. Females continue to be at risk of poverty and experiencing inequality of opportunities due to the persistent differential employment earnings potentials, which in turn are due to the fact that women continue to dis disproportionately shoulder childcare responsibility in South Africa. Nelson Mandela warned that for every woman and girl child violently attacked, we reduce our humanity. Indeed, this humanity is reduced when lawmakers people who have sworn to uphold the constitution and themselves stand accused as perpetrators in the scourge of ravaging of society. To the women who wake up at dawn to stand at the street corners hoping for a day's work as domestic workers, we see you. To the children who fail, to the girl child who fights to get an education but faces challenges of not having sanitary child towels, we see you. To the Goko who has been waiting since 1994 to receive an RDP house, Goko, we also see you. We are sorry. We are very sorry that this government is failing you. We are very sorry that this government is failing to give women jobs, houses, and their dignity in the way that we should be. Decisive action means nothing to the people of South Africa unless it reaches them. Chairperson, taking no responsibility for their part in the failures, the ANC speakers after speaker came and blamed everything on everybody else but themselves. 29 years since they being in power. So this afternoon, let me take a minute and say to the ANC, I challenge you. I challenge you to take responsibility for what South Africa could have achieved if this government was deliberate about the emancipation of women, serious about protecting women from being violated emotionally, economically, and sexually. I dare you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, honorable Members. Honorable members, uh, you from the box, I declare this one a maiden speech. Uh, the Honorable the Deputy Minister in the Presidency responsible for planning, monitoring, and evaluation.
Me, thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Speaker, and our Deputy Chief Whip and all Honorable Members who are here. Speaker, I'm aware of what you have just said, Chair, but there's a call I also want to make to all of us in this house to join hands and speak in one voice in respect of gender-based violence and femicide. Without political point scoring, we are not going anywhere if we do that. Especially because this is an emotional issue. And until you are directly affected, either in person or somebody close to you, you will refrain from grandstanding. It is very dangerous to do that. As well as when you are a woman, Honorable Operma. But just a quick one to, to Honorable Tener. I happen to do State of the Nation Awareness in Tia Vatarskluf. Seven Dorpis. One of them is Hrabo around uh, this area of the Western Cape. Hrabo, Elgin, Villiers Dorp, Botrefir, Calidon, Middleton, Tes Tesla Dam, the heart of producing apples in South Africa. And those apples, it's farm workers who are working there. They are applied very appalling. Seven Dorpies, one school for black children, primary, one school for black children, um, high school. Can we still do the same thing and start to say this school is for blacks, this school is for whites? No, medium of instruction. So inclusivity and how black people are treated, especially in the farming areas. It's something that we must look at. So please, as we deal with some of these things, the gogo that you are talking about, Honorable Bodlan, walking in that sewer in Kayanicha. See her as well. Thank you very much. Honorable Chair, the International Women's Day Organization's website homepage challenges us, and I quote, to imagine a gender equal world, a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that's diverse, equitable and inclusive, a world where difference is valued and celebrated. Together we can forge women's equality, celebrate women's achievement, raise awareness about discrimination, take action, to drive gender parity, close quote. On this International Women's Day, which is coming tomorrow, 2023, under this year's theme of hashtag embrace equity, I challenge us to imagine a gender equal South Africa, a South Africa free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a South Africa that's diverse, equitable and inclusive, a South Africa where difference and diversity is valued and celebrated, a country where together we can forge women's equality, we can truly celebrate and reward women's achievement, we can openly raise awareness about discrimination without fear, take action to drive gender parity in accordance with our constitution. This year's theme of hashtag embrace equity calls upon us to compare equality and with equity. And despite its similarities, they are inherently different concepts. The IWD 2023 campaign theme seeks to help to forge worldwide conversations about this important issue and its impact. And in short, gender equality is simply focused on providing all with the same equal opportunities, like making it legal for women to own land or even attend school, because in some parts of Africa and the world, 
this is still not normalized, legal, or even acceptable. Gender equity, though, works to correct the historical wrongs that have left women behind, such as societal restrictions on employment or cultural norms about women, which play out in the home, in the workplace, in communities, and society at large. Chair, there is no better case study or example in the world more than our very own equity action plan in South Africa in correcting the ills of apartheid, which included amongst others, the greatest constitution in the world, the triple BEE scheme, the DTI corporate targets, as a few examples to illustrate this point. Our National Development Plan 2030 is not an equality action plan. Remember the difference between equity and equality for good reasons. Neither in our continent's blueprint, Agenda 2063, and its self-sustainability goal, or the Decade of Africa Women's Economic and Financial Inclusion 2020 to 2030, declared by our very own President Cyril Ramaphosa, when South Africa took over chairship of the African Union in February 2020. The aim of the IWD 2023 campaign theme is to get the world talking about why equal opportunities aren't enough. People start from different places and women most likely start from right at the bottom or from the back. So decisive action needs to be about measurable inclusion. This requires equitable action to start out with because equitable action will give rise to equality, not the other way around. So, so now that I have given you the full view of what needs to be achieved holistically, my role today is to put into perspective what needs to be done in our decisive action to advance women's rights in South Africa, Africa and the world, and how everything we have done up until now has to be evolved because it, it has become no longer enough, no matter how good our intentions are. Chair, I'd like to present to this house, with, to present this house with a few examples. Government has delivered an inclusive labor law frameworks and policies on gender equality and women representation in the, in the workplace. We have good intentions to create an enabling environment to close the gender gap in South Africa and Africa, but it is no longer enough. Decisive action has to be taken to truly dismantle and reconstruct policies, policy framework regulation and historical injustice of the remuneration and reward system at the core of South Africa's economic structures. Government delivered on creating policies for the girl child to be prioritized in education and economic inclusion. Through the launch of the 2017 Keeping Girls in Schools program by the Department of Basic Education. It is also this administration that proudly delivered on zero rating VET on sanitary pets in 2018. It is with good intention that we create, endorse, and partner on programs that support distribution of pets, menstrual cups, and tampons, etc. But this, sadly, is also no longer enough. Decisive action has to be taken for menstruation to be treated as a budgeting line item, as a cost to government through national treasury, given the same distribution access and availability rights that are given to condoms. Government delivered on a national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide. Just over a year ago, on 28 January 2022, it was this administration's uh, President Ramaphosa who signed into law legislations aimed at strengthening efforts and end gender-based violence with a victim-centered focus by this administration on combating this dehumanizing pandemic. We know those three laws were not makers. This was more than just good intention. 
This was action yet 10 months later. In October, the South African crime stats were released and it reported that in three months between April and June last year, 855 women and 243 children were murdered. In a full year from February 2022 to January 2023, 1,842 1, women and 391 children were killed somewhere else in the world. On a three month comparison to South Africa, it would be 460 women and 98 children, which is about half of South Africa's deaths. Very disturbing statistics. There would be no person, there would not be a person in this house that would disagree with me when I say that, according to the stats, <laughs> we are living in a war zone because our numbers of only the murder category on gender-based violence are almost double that of an actual war zone. Whether you take Ukraine as an example or what is happening in the DRC and elsewhere, something has to change. So it is with the best intention that we support gender-based violence and femicide programs, initiatives, and campaigns. We actively set up task forces, committees, and commissions, and even dedicate funding to it. And these are honorable actions, but they have unfortunately also become not enough. GBVF is costing South Africa economy about 40 billion rand in context that is just less than half of what load shedding cost us last year. So we should at least be half as outraged and action oriented as we are about load shedding. Decisive action will need to be taken to not just declare GBVF a pandemic, but for it to receive the treatment and status of a pandemic in all government departments in our society and everywhere else, the church, it should be all of us who come together and join hands. And as the person with delegated responsibility for this administration planning, monitoring and evaluation, what does decisive action look like for us as government? And how do we use all that we have done as the building blocks to eradicate this pandemic? Our constitution has given a platform to civil society in our country to be strong and bold on matters of action campaign. And we're proud of this enabling environment that government has created. But it is time for us to evolve this enablement into embracing active citizenry towards an equitable action plan. And I think the DA and women next to me who are making noise should also be part of these things. To give you an example, I have long been a vocal advocate on the war on gender-based violence, mostly due to my own personal experience in involving my own advocacy to taking decisive action because I'm a victim as well. I'm heeding President Cyril Ramaphosa's call and I want all of us to join towards ending what His Excellency called a war being waged against the women and children of our country by working with the private sector to not just endorse, but actually lead an active citizenry, drive to eradicate this pandemic in the same way we eradicated COVID-19. If we join hands, we can go further. It is no longer enough to just deliver on policy and regulations. We have to lead from the front in those things which are destabilizing our country, preventing our foreign direct investment into our country. And those who are ruining the good name of South Africa in the world. Now it is time for us to act and act decisively. I thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. 
That, honorable members, concludes the debate. Order. I request members to stand and wait for the mains to leave the chamber. Malibongwe. That concludes the business for the day and the house is adjourned.